Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I uh, remind you that this is the last week of the normal labs that we are going uh, you know, to develop normally, individually, uh, so the, for this Thursday. And from the next week, uh, we are going to start the uh, um, so-called uh, big labs, uh, big lab number one. And we are going to start uh, uh, with the uh, uh, with the React framework. So uh, up to now, the, this course uh, and up to this week, including all this week, uh, is uh, or oh, it was on, on basic uh, technologies, HTML and CSS and JavaScript. Uh, from next week, uh, we will start you know, attacking the the, the real um, framework uh, that we are going to work uh, for the rest of the course. Uh, this means that uh, in the in the labs, uh, you should try to work uh, as a group. Uh, uh, we will give you uh, instruction for uh, for the creation of the groups and the uh, creation of the repository that you have to work in to, uh, to submit uh, your work uh, at the end of the four weeks uh, of the first big lab. Okay. Um, so up to now, you've been working individually and uh, uh, from, from next Thursday, so the, the beginning of, the, of next week, uh, we should try to stick with the um, the time schedule that you're being assigned, so group one and group two, and try to work as a group uh, because the submission will be on a group level. We will use a platform which is called uh, um, GitHub Classroom. I don't know if you already, already had experience on that. Uh, it's basically a front end on GitHub that helps you uh, to create, <clears throat> automatically fork and clone, and clone yes, one project where you can work. So uh, there will be a, a very simple procedure when you have to associate your GitHub username, personal GitHub username, with uh, your name uh, and, uh, and student ID. I will have to upload the list. Um, and so you, uh, you will match that, and you will uh, match the group in which you are. So the first one that logs in will create a group, and the others will join. Mm -hmm. So it's not complex, but uh, let's try to get it right. And I'm saying this also because if there is someone which is still not uh, regularly enrolled and so on. So it's not on the, on the official list of students uh, and maybe because they have some issues with the, with the enrollment or whatever. Just tell me because I need to add you on the list of students uh, so that you can uh, match your uh, username. Hmm? Okay, but that's all for, for next week. This week we are uh, trying to close the loop and uh, uh, add the last ingredient. Uh, so uh, we have been working in the, Simple static HTML on the browser. We have been working with dynamic, uh, say, JavaScript code uh, on uh, Node.js. <clears throat> Today, we'll try to see how <clears throat> the JavaScript interpreter inside the browsers is working and how we can interact uh, uh, with the web page. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, uh, we imagine that uh, our browsers already contain a JavaScript interpreter. Uh, basically, it was the other way around. So first, the browser started to have an interpreter, and then some people pulled it out of the browser and created Node.js. Okay, Node.js was created from for, by forking the JavaScript interpreter inside Chrome. Uh, but right now, we have a, a web page that only contains uh, HTML code, and so first of all, we have to load some code, uh, some JavaScript code into the page. Mm -hmm. So the JavaScript code will run in the browser always in the context of a single web page, of a single HTML page. So there is no such thing as uh, running the JavaScript in the browser. No. We are opening a page, and the page loads uh, and executes uh, the JavaScript code that will be confined, uh, strictly confined, to uh, that page. So the code in one page cannot see or modify or read anything else outside this page. It will run in a sandbox environment where actually it can only uh, interact with the page itself. Um, of course, uh, uh, there's, there's a possibility of writing directly JavaScript inside an HTML page with a script tag, but we are not going to do that uh, uh, ever. And for us, uh, JavaScript will always be you know, in an external file that we are all loading. Like we are loading uh, style sheets uh, from external files, uh, we are loading JavaScript files, uh, uh, JavaScript uh, source code from the external file. And basically, there are four different ways 
of loading an external file into a web page. So the browser automatically, when it loads a page, it uh, may find the script tag. And the script tag means uh, stop loading the HTML page for now, load the JavaScript file, execute the content of the JavaScript file, and when the execution is over, is terminated, then continue to load the rest of the HTML page. Okay? That's the algorithm that the browser always follows when it finds a, a script tag. Historically, uh, people told you, okay, mm, to, write, to insert the script tag into the head section of your document. Okay? This is not the, the best idea. Uh, okay, it's very clean because in the head you have all the references to the external resources that you need, like import statements uh, in a program. But uh, the problem is that when you are loading the HTML page, the loading basically stops here before any part of the page has been loaded, so the browser is still an, at a blank page. And uh, the browser should wait uh, until the JavaScript file is downloaded and then executed, and only then uh, it will start reading the real content of the page. Furthermore, this code uh, could not do a lot of work into the page, actually, actually can go any work on the page, because the page is not loaded yet. So at this point, when you are executing the script, uh, this code, uh, this part of the page, the body of the page, doesn't exist yet, because the browser hasn't seen it yet. Hmm? Uh, so uh, that was the reason why uh, a lot of sources suggest to put in the script tag at the end of the body, so just before the end of the body. Why is that? OK, because first of all, uh, the page is already loaded at this point. So most of the HTML content is already being loaded. And the browser is already started to side load all the external resources. So maybe there are some images, some fonts, something that need be, needs to be downloaded. And the, the browser already knows that because we have the image tags in, in here in the body. And uh, in parallel, the browser already started downloading all the stuff. So we are not blocking the, lo the loading and the, and the layout of the page. And uh, at the same time, when we are here, this JavaScript code may act already access the real body of the page because it has already been loaded. Hmm? So uh, it's still a synchronous loading. So we are still blocking the browser from uh, continuing to, to load the rest of the page. But basically, the rest of the page will be empty. Hmm? So we are not really blocking anything. That was the suggestion, no, okay, uh, at the beginning, and then mm, more recently, so this is a sort of a timing diagram that will st uh, tell us that uh, uh, with, um, uh, with the um, script uh, in the header, the page loading is waiting, and if we're putting uh, it in, at the end of the body, then the page load uh, will execute after passing HTML, so it doesn't slow it down. Mm -hmm. But more recently, they added into HTML two new uh, attributes uh, to the script uh, element, which are called async and defer. So these are, of course, for, for uh, recent version of HTML, but they are supported everywhere today. And they mean that uh, uh, the loading of the script is, not, is no longer synchronous, it's no longer blocking. Both of them are the, the same effect. So we can, again, put the script tag into the head of the document by telling the browser, OK, you have this to, to, lo to load. Okay? Lo try start the loading, the downloading, and the execution of that, uh, of that file asynchronously while you are still loading the rest of the page. So we can put the script tag back on the head. And the difference between async and defer is that the async tag uh, is telling the browser to download the script uh, and start executing it uh, as long as it's being downloaded. So immediately, uh, immediately, when, when it wants, but it may start downloading, uh, sorry, executing the file as soon as it, it's, its download is complete. We may not want it because maybe uh, we are loading different scripts, different files, and with an asynchronous loading, this file can be executed in any order because it depends on which is the faster to download. Okay, so it's maybe too asynchronous, okay, because the files are downloaded uh, in any possible order. Um, the a better alternative, and which is the preferred way, is to use the defer attribute. And say, okay, 
download these files in sequence, but asynchronously to each other, to, to the loading of the page. Hmm? Uh, basically, uh, the idea is that uh, um, with an async tag, where the browser starts parsing the HTML, when it, fa when it finds this, the, um, the, the script tag, we start loading the script from, from the server. And when this, as soon as the script is downloaded, we will start executing it. So we'll say, stop and pause the, execute, the, the loading of the page uh, in, at any time, at any point in time. Maybe the page is not, hasn't you know, finished loading yet, uh, but the JavaScript was faster, uh, and uh, um, it will start executing here. So, but we have actually no control over the time when this execu execution starts. The loading is not a problem. It will happen asynchronously, so it doesn't you know, interfere in any way with the loading of the page. But the execution can. With a defer attribute, what we are doing is that to actually defer, as the word said, the, the execution of the script until the document is ready. So until the moment where the full HTML has been loaded. But uh, we are starting the execution here while the loading already happened in advance, in parallel to the loading of the page. So this, I think, is the best uh, solution, not because it gives us sequential execution of the scripts uh, in order in which they are loaded, but asynchronous loading uh, um, during the page load within the HTML uh, code. So we, to make a long story short, we are uh, always try to use uh, this kind of uh, syntax, so everything can be put into the header document. And at the beginning, we have all the declarations that we need. Okay, so. We uh, loaded some code that was external to the page, and we say that we are running it. So we are running in, in an interpreter inside the browser, so inside the so-called JavaScript sandbox. So it's a protected environment in which the JavaScript code has only very limited access to external objects. So the JavaScript code cannot, for example, open a file on your computer or delete a file on your computer, huh? that it would be much more fun. Um, basically, all, everything that the browser, that the JavaScript code uh, can access uh, is through a global object, which is called window. So you have all the library functions, all the normal, say, standard library functions from JavaScript, uh, but these functions basically don't have any resources to work with. Uh, the resources you can work with are uh, properties of one global object, which is called window. In Node.js, we didn't use the global object. There was one implicit object called global. Hmm? The name was global. But we normally, we don't need to use it hmm? because we can just use the resources of the operating system. In the browser, to access anything, we, can, we, should, we could only access what the window object will allow us to use. Hmm? And uh, um, basically, in this global environment, uh, I it's called global from the point of view of the script, uh, but it's very local from the point of view of the browser, because every single page, if you are opening three tabs in a browser, each tab has their own uh, independent global environment uh, for the JavaScript code. Okay, So it's something inside a single browser tab. And what the JavaScript code can access basically are three different uh, libraries. One is the standard JavaScript library, so everything we know about arrays and uh, uh, strings and functions, etc., is already there. Okay, it's the standard JavaScript library. Then we have two extra libraries that are called uh, the BOM Bo uh, browser object model. So some objects that describe the capabilities of the browser. And uh, most importantly, the DOM is the document object model, which has some objects uh, that are uh, that represent the content of the web page. Mm -hmm. We already had a, a glimpse of the DOM uh, when uh, learning CSS, uh, when we say that okay, the tree of CSS elements uh, is arranged into a, a tree of objects, uh, and of course, uh, uh, all of these objects can be accessed, uh, read, mo um, and, and modified, uh, created, and deleted. Uh, uh, by the JavaScript code. So you have full control over this. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a, 
uh, a strange model where um, ma many summit execution model where in a single page you may have uh, multiple scripts. So you may load one, two, three different scripts, uh, one after the other in the head of the document. What happens is that all the scripts uh, share the same global scope. So basically they can see each other's global variables. And global variables are those variables defined at the top level context. So outside of any functions or function def definitions themselves. So we, if we are defining a function at the global scope, at, no, at the outside scope, not inside the uh, nested, uh, nested uh, environment, that function is attached automatically as a property of the global object. So if you open a um, JavaScript file, you say function A, that, act, that the name A of the function actually becomes a, a property of window, window.a. And not only that script that created this function can call the function and see the name, but all the other scripts. When they use the name A, even if it's not declared in the same file, it's unsettling at the beginning. Um, even if not the same file, they can see it through the global object. Uh, this is the old model where all the code, basically you can imagine all the code being concatenated in one big JavaScript file and being executed from top to bottom. And then if you want to break it down in separate files, you can do that for your own convenience, but the, the execution model doesn't see the separation of the different files. It's a bit, uh, it's not, not very you know, uh, clean, uh, they work in this way, and that's why uh, later on modules will be introduced and we'll see how they work uh, directly when we are using them in React. Uh, the combination of modules and, uh, um, and NPM uh, to, to download them. But for the moment, we're just at the raw level. Hmm. Okay, so about the execution model, uh, the browser is a highly asynchronous environment. Okay, so everything happening in a web page uh, is asynchronous. So the user moving the mouse, the user typing something, uh, the a page loading, an image loading, uh, uh, all the operations in, inside a web page are basically input output operations, all of them. And so all of them will be carried, down, uh, carried out asynchronously. And uh, the browser has a very, uh, um, say, powerful uh, asynchronous uh, execution model based uh, on, an, uh, on, a, on a management of an event loop. So a very queue, uh, say, a list uh, of events uh, that need to be processed. There are many types of events. Uh, Okay, all asynchronous events, and most of them, there are hundreds of events that the browser may generate, and uh, um, most of them are generated by user actions. So moving, using mouse, keyboard, uh, and all the input uh, facilities, and some of them are uh, generated by network events, input-output events. So basically starting the completion of, an, of a loading of an element. Hmm? Uh, all of these events uh, are handled by the browser, and maybe, uh, you know, uh, managed uh, uh, also by your code. If you want, uh, you can listen to, event, to an event and uh, define a callback to be executed for that specific event. So all of these asynchronous events happen in a basically synchronous uh, uh, execution, execution engine, which is the JavaScript engine. So there is no, as we already said, there's no real multi-threading in JavaScript. It's a cooperative uh, asynchronous execution model. So basically, inside the browser, we have something like that. You have the JavaScript code that in the, so the sequential part of the execution model is based on allocating objects uh, into a memory heap. Okay, so we have, well, every time you create an object uh, through a new statement or just by opening a brace, uh, you are allocating some space somewhere, and this object can be referred, can be shared, so the classical reference value model that we're already familiar with. And then we have the sequential code that is based on a call step, function calling function, calling function, and so on. And the function returns and comes back to the previous uh, function and so on. So this is the synchronous part of the JavaScript uh, code. But then there are all sorts of asynchronous events. 
A synchronous event may be I set, I'm setting a timer or maybe the user click on the button. This cannot be inserted synchronously in the execution model. So whenever an event happens, uh, it will be put uh, at the end of a queue of uh, callback functions to be executed. This is the same for promises, okay? When a promise uh, is resolved, uh, okay, the code of the resolution of the, of the promise will not be executed right now. We know that we will execute the callback as soon as possible. So this as soon as possible is a, a queue, a list, uh, of callbacks to be called. That is basically a, a five for queue, no? first in, first out. Basically, not really. Some, uh, the arrow functions take the precedent, they have a, a, another sub, sub queue that makes them go faster, but this is just a detail. So, what happens is that the JavaScript interpreter usually runs uh, in a synchronous mode, it processes all the synchronous code. Then there will come a point where all the functions are terminated. We finish the execution of synchronous code. So the program doesn't have anything else to do in the synchronous part. At that point, the first callback is pulled from this callback queue and it is injected into the call stack. So like somebody called that function. The function was called automatically, let's say. And when it, I'm Processing this callback uh, that was scheduled for the user clicking the button, this will become again synchronous execution of that call. That code may call function and schedule stuff and so on. If it calls something synchronously, it will be of course uh, stored in the stack. If uh, our code creates a promise or sets a timeout or creates some asynchronous event, that will be put into the callback queue at the end of the queue itself. When the synchronous code leading to execution, coming from the execution of, of an event, again, is uh, terminated, so we did everything we need to do, the call stack will be empty again, and we will pull the second callback from the callback queue, put it into the stack, and start executing it. Okay, so this means that every code we write inside a callback is blocking when the javascript when the browser is executing one procedure one callback one function it cannot do anything else it cannot process other events so the page is frozen uh, it cannot load an, uh, the html page it cannot process other types of events that pushes us very hard to be as asynchronous as possible so a callback should return immediately, and if, there, if it has more work to do, it should, we should try to schedule it asynchronously, to be done asynchronously. Okay? Otherwise, the, the whole interface will be very sluggish because we are doing some processing in a, in a synchronous context. It looks like it's asynchronous because it's in a promise body, for example, but then when this part of the promise body, uh, the, the callback, is actually executed, then that, that will be the only code uh, real in execution, okay? So we are, we are already a bit familiar with that, and you know, we are lucky that uh, uh, JavaScript really forces us to work with, uh, with a sync function, for example. So a sync and await. Await is not blocking. An await statement doesn't block. We just uh, uh, stop ex actually exec stop executing the code because we know that after a way, the code continues and, uh, and put into a certain, you know, uh, outside of the stack, and we can and the browser can start processing other types of events. Hmm? Um, okay, so basically, the, the the browser is always executing either some synchronous functions or some asynchronous events. Uh, then, when they are picked, they really behave as a synchronous uh, uh, execution. An event tender or any function is never interrupted. So, beware. Hmm? Okay. Uh, so this is how the code is running. Uh, what what are the libraries uh, that our JavaScript code can execute? Because otherwise we are, can only you know execute code or creating strings, integers. But how can we do some input output and let the result of our code be seen? Um, like we said, 
we have one window global object uh, that has some properties that correspond basically to the browser features. We are not using this very much. Uh, we are, there's a, a, a strong separation between the browser information, the browser features, and the page information, the content of the, the HTML page. Most of our processes will be about the page. Some of it uh, could be also interaction with the browser, like you know, uh, opening a new window, resizing the window. Uh, but these are operations that usually tend to be very rare because they, they disrupt the navigation of the user. Let the user control the browser, and we manipulate the page inside the window. Maybe there's some, there will be some time where we need to query maybe the browser to know uh, the resolution at the beginning, but this is mostly better to be left to the CSS style sheets that are able with the media queries to, to interact with the browser. So basically, the, the, the browser object model is not very useful. Hmm? Uh, there's one, one property, which is called console, that is the sim a similar object to the console we had in, uh, in Node.js. So we can write console.log in, also in the browser. Uh, and it will be printed out uh, onto the debugging console of the browser itself. So normal users will not see it, but uh, developers uh, in, uh, in, the, um, in the console, in the developer tools, can see the output of the console. See, this is a JavaScript console running, waiting. This was the HTML page from the last week, so it doesn't contain any JavaScript code yet. Okay. But we have a, a console where we can, where, that can we use, we can use to debug you know, our code. The most important property, so we don't need to write window.console because window is the global object, so by default, uh, every name uh, will be referred to the global context itself. Console.log is okay. Document, it will be the key and we'll study uh, better. Location is the URL of the current page. So when you open a page, this is the current location. So the, the, the address of the web page is accessible in the window.location. You can read it and you can also modify this property. So if you write window.location equal to some URL, the browser will go there, okay? We'll open that page. Of course, it's a suicide mission because as soon as the browser loads another page, your JavaScript is killed. Okay? The browser will load possibly the JavaScript that will be in the next page. But since your JavaScript is bound to this page, you are changing the page. This is the last action that you can do on that page. History is able, uh, contains the, the, the history of the navigation in your current website, so you cannot see the navigation before you enter this website, but you can use it for, for handling back and forth. But there are very you know, corner cases, basically. There are also some uh, storage uh, containers accessible to you in the browser that are called uh, local storage, uh, which is a basically a dictionary where you can store information it's a map, um, locally to a page, so it will be forgotten when the page is gone, or local to the session, so if you have several pages, the information will be stored uh, even for the next pages. Um, again, this it's the kind of storage where you are, uh, when you're logging into a website and then the day after the website recognizes you, it's because uh, the JavaScript code stored something in the session storage uh, for that website. Again, it's used in a in a very specific corner cases. We'll see how the normal uh, information will be stored on the server or directly in the JavaScript code. So these are basic functions, but normally we're trying to wrap them into something more sophisticated. But what the real interest for us is the the object model. Uh, which is a, an object representation of the HTML, HTML page. So every element in our HTML page will map uh, to a specific uh, object, JavaScript object, and we can access all 
knows in the page all attributes and all text elements in a web page by just querying these three of objects. That is pointed by the global variable document. Hmm? Uh, so we imagine an HTML file being broken down as a tree of elements. We can navigate these elements through some APIs, their function for going from one node to its children, from one node to, their, for, to its parent, um, to siblings, and so on. And we can modify uh, the content of a node. We can create a new node. We can do anything we want uh, with these three of nodes. And anything we do with these three of nodes will be immediately reported or updated on the visual part of the page. So there is a, li a live link uh, that the browser takes, takes care of. The browser, will, the browser will always take care of keeping the JavaScript object model and the layout of the page itself, visible part of the page itself, always in sync. If the user is typing something to a text field, the property value of an input element inside this object tree will change immediately. And if you are changing this property, maybe a text property or a, or a style or a class of a property of, a, of an element here, then the effect of this change will be automatically updated on the JavaScript page. Okay, so when we are talking about the DOM, we are talking about the page. Basically, the DOM is also the data structure used by the browser itself to paint the page on the screen. Hmm? So we are basically plugging into the um, and poking into the JavaScript uh, uh, internal, sorry, into the browser internal data structures. And we can do everything the browser can do on that page. Um, so about uh, some types of nodes that we have, types like classes, okay, uh, different types of objects. Uh, we have one object with, of type document that represents uh, the root node of the page. Uh, this node is usually points uh, to a tree of element nodes. So an element uh, corresponds to an HTML tag. So we will have an HTML element, and then we'll have a, a head element, a body element. Uh, inside the body, we may have div element, and so on. So every HTML tag, HTML element, we call that, Correspond to a, a node in the DOM of type element here, which is one type of node. Okay, um, an element can contain other elements, or it can contain attributes. So, a node containing an element means that the other, the children element, are nested inside the parent node. Attributes are just the attributes that you write in the declaration of the node. So, image source equal HTTP something, the source attribute is another node of type attribute connected to the element. So the definition of a node, we have the type of element, contains the type of element, the list of attributes to that element instance, and the list of children. That's all we have to define. So is this a div or a, a p or an h1 or whatever, the type of element? Who are his children? And what are, if possible, in this picture, we don't show the attributes. That's, that's all there is. Uh, of course, attributes are all the possible properties. So they, they, all the attributes also contain all the CSS properties that are attributes of the style property. And for working with the uh, API, we usually manipulate uh, nodes, object of type node, or object uh, or, or list of nodes. Okay, so when we are a node and we are seeking the children of the node, uh, we have an array, a list, a specific, a special data structure which is called node list that behaves like an array, or more, more or less, that we can. You know, iterate uh, like in an array, we can pick an element, uh, we can iterate over that, and so on. For 
it's not a real uh, a basic JavaScript array, but it, it's a, a wrapper, a small wrapper uh, around the JavaScript array itself. Hmm. So, what can we do with this DOM? What are the methods offered by this library? We have methods for finding a node. So I want to change the text of an element to red or whatever. OK, let's first find the element and then change some of, this, of, the, of uh, its properties. And finding an element uh, it can be done with one of these uh, possible methods. These are all methods of the document object. Document is a global name inside the window object. So we can call it document. It's already predefined dot get element by ID. Like the name says, it will return me the reference to one node, and specifically the node who has the ID attribute equal to the value that is specified. OK? And this will return either one or zero nodes, of course. The ID is unique, so it will only find one. If there, is, if there isn't, of course, it will return now uh, response. Or we may search elements by tag name, div, p, image, table, the name of an element. Of course, in a, in a given page, there may be several divs, there may be several tables, there may be several images. That's why the result is a plural, elements, not element. And means that it will return a node list and not just a single node. So maybe if we, if we know that we have just one single table, uh, okay, we know that this node list will contain only one element and we pick the first one. But the result will always be a list. Or by class name, again. All the elements with class equal to danger, for example, or error message. There may be many elements in the page and we get the list of all the elements of, of any type. Some may be a P, some may be a div, some may be a span, as long as they have the specific class registered to them. Or if we are, you know, if we know uh, CSS, we can also use the CSS syntax, since the browser already knows how to parse the CSS. So we can access the parsing engine of the CSS part, uh, the CSS module inside the browser by giving, uh, by providing a CSS selector of any type, any type of CSS selector. So with the full syntax of selectors, and uh, I use the query selector or the query selector all to have the browser find the first node or all the nodes that match, so depends on whether I, I want the first one or all of them, um, that match a specific CSS selector. Okay, we, this did, of course, is the general case. With this, we can select uh, an element by ID by just giving the hash syntax in the CSS. We can select all the elements by tag name by just giving the name of the tag, or by class name by just giving the dot and name of the class. This one, this two uh, later one were introduced later, but right now they are more you know, uh, used because with that call, we can do everything. The, the other three are more special cases. Hmm? Right now it's a, a special case. So we can find a node, and once you find a node, uh, you can manipulate its properties. Uh, there are just a detail, some of the, all these uh, search elements usually are called uh, from the document node or the root of the page. You may also uh, call one of these search functions from a given node. So these methods are also available on the node object, uh, and they will only search the part of the tree behind that node, below that node. Okay, so maybe you can find uh, uh, the main, uh, an element with the ID equal to main, and then inside this main, I, I find all the paragraphs. So not, they will not be all the paragraphs in the page, but only the paragraphs inside the main section. Hmm? So you can, you can combine them in this way, or you could use a, a query selector like main space P that will select all the P's inside the main session. So with CSS, we can do the same with one with just one call. Um, and we can already try it in the, in the browser console. 
okay? Because, for example, if we have this page that we created last time with a table and so on, and so we can, for example, get a reference to this table. So this is the only element called table, so we can define const. Uh, let me see if I can make it a bit larger. Yes, console. Let's focus on the console. Uh, I can write uh, const table equal to document dot query selector table, for example. Table. Okay. And so I have a table object right now that points uh, to the table object itself. So what I did is just a, uh, no, a JavaScript statement that gives me a, a reference to a variable. And define, of course, is the return value of const, uh, which doesn't return anything. But if I inspect this value, uh, it will print me the actual you know, string representation of the object. So in this case, it's pointing to the table, and the interactive console in the browser lets me inspect the content of this element. Okay, so it has a lot of properties. And uh, by clicking here, I can highlight the part of the code and highlight the part of the page that corresponds to this element. So these are just features uh, of the interactive console of the browser, inside the browser. Okay? But actually, this is a normal uh, JavaScript variable. <clears throat> I could uh, uh, inspect uh, its properties. So, for example, uh, we have uh, table dot uh, children, child nodes, for example. I can query that specific node asking what are your children, and it will uh, create a list, return a list of five child nodes. So it means that in our tree, we have one inside the DOM somewhere, we just use a query selector to find a node in the middle of all the page. Uh, I can query this node to check which are his three children. And now, right now it has five children. Text, t head, text, t body, text. So what is this text here? It's the white space. If I go to the source code, here we see that the table Let's expand that. Actually, has two real node children, two real element children. But from the this point here to the beginning of the head, we have some new line and some spaces. These are a text from a fragment of text that's only white space, so the browser will ignore it; it will not display anything. But we could have a real text. Then we have a second ch uh, child, which is the T head element, that will contain other children, other information, but it's just a reference to the node. Then we have a reference to another text node, which is the new line here and the white space at the beginning of the T body. Then we have the T body node, reference to the element, and then we have the space uh, between the end of the T body and the, uh, the start of the tag table, slash table. Okay, so all of this is uh, list here in the uh, not list. We, if we expand the list, we see actually the content of the text, which is new line and spaces, and the TID is a real reference to a node, and so on. So we want to see the content of the first row, for example. Okay, so we can check, get the third child. which is a T-body, we will have uh, some children of, it, of, of itself uh, that will be rows. All these text nodes are a bit uh, uh, no, inconvenient. So there is another property, which is called children, that only lists uh, uh, the real elements that are children of the node. So it will skip all the text nodes. So if we know that the text will only contain white space, we can really go to children. There is a small difference between 
This is because child nodes is an old list object which are, has a lot of uh, features and uh, uh, while children is just an HTML collection uh, object uh, which doesn't have all the methods of an array, it only has one method called item. Get the item zero, item one, item two. We see that there are you know, overlapping APIs for doing the same thing because during the years they add the new methods for uh, for uh, doing different stuff. But what, what we can, I could do is to uh, take the second child, so children dot item one of the table. And it's the tbody, tells me the console. And I can take the first row, so the ch children of this tbody are three rows, tr, tr, tr. I take the first one. And I can get the children of that, of this tr, that are a td. I can get the first one, zero. And they can get the text content. There's a property called text content that e extracts uh, all the text uh, inside all the children of an element. And in this case, we have a string with the name of the first element. So we can you know, navigate. It's a very fragile way of navigating that. Because if uh, one will add one column or add one row and everything will break, okay? If I'm adding one table on the top of that, because maybe there's a, a table with some icons uh, for navigating the page, uh, then all the code will point, uh, you know, the query selector will, set, will find the first table instead, instead of the second one. But so with, with these methods, we can really you know, see everything. And we see that the table that we are talking about, this is an example, has a lot of uh, properties. So we are expanding, what we are expanding here in the console it, are actually the properties of the object. A table is a reference to an object in the DOM. And these are all the properties visible to us, to that object. We saw that uh, already have child nodes, which is a property whose value is a node list. Children is a property whose value is an HTML collection. So we can use it to refer to other nodes and so on. If we want to know what are the HTML classes, CSS classes applied to an object, we have a class list uh, property. We have not a, um, we have Two properties. One is class name and the other is class list. They are synchronized. The difference is the class name is a string with all the classes separated by uh, with a space. Class list is already a collection. Sorry, yeah, is already a list. So we can add and remove elements from this list in a much uh, easier way than mangling with the string the string content. So there are diff also different ways. Uh, of accessing the same information. All the other attributes of the table are, are available there. If we want to navigate the children, we have a first child reference, which is the same as children item zero and so on. Uh, sorry, no, child nodes uh, uh, item zero and so on. We have a very useful property which is called inner HTML, which contains all the inside of the tag as a string. Well, it's not very useful to read in this way, but let's remember that we can also write, change this attribute. So if we change the inner HTML property of any element, we are actually replacing the content of that element with any HTML fragment we like. So we can reconstruct, rebuild the parts of the page by inserting whatever we want in HTML. So in our JavaScript code, we can inject fragments of HTML wherever we want. The browser will parse that and we will convert that to objects. So this HTML is actually identical. It's the same as the content that we, that we get through the child nodes. 
in this case, in the form of a tree, in the other case, in the form of a string fragment. So depending on what we have to do. If you want to add one node, we can work with shell node, which only can append something to the inner HTML. And we have the inner text property that we used before to see the content of a cell, which uh, is the same as the inner HTML with all the HTML tags stripped out. So we'll just have all the text content uh, between the tags, uh, but excluding the, the text themselves. It's not very useful in this case because it will put together content from the different cells. Is normally useful only when we are on a terminal node, a node that only contains text that doesn't contain any other elements. Hmm? And we are on a terminal node whenever the, for example, children property is length zero. So there are no elements inside. Um, there's an interesting, one of the many properties are, is called the style property. style with, with the s is here which uh, seems a single proper a simple property but actually if, if we expand it it has hundreds of properties which are all the possible css properties that we can set and read or modify on this element all of them so uh, we want to make uh, the text in the table red no problem we can let me close it because it's. We can just have our your table. Dot style. Dot uh, color. Equal to red. That's it. We are applying some property directly to an element, which is the same that uh, operation that we could do with CSS. We select an element by hand and we change some property by hand. So we can do, uh, basically, we, can, we have full control over the element. Of course, uh, uh, we need to be a little familiar with the main properties of this kind of, uh, of nodes. Uh, and uh, we had a look at the, the children nodes. There's also a parent property that points up. Where is the parent parent element here or parent node, which in this case they are they point to the same node with a parent of the table. So this is a tree where every node can go to its children, every node can go to the parents, can go also to its, its siblings. There's a previous sibling and a, a next sibling. Next is before because we start with n. So we can also navigate from node to the node at the same level or to the parent or to the children so when it's like uh, my feeling is that uh, like navigating blind or driving blind okay so you know you are somewhere you have some way to move in the four directions up and down and left and right uh, but actually you don't know really you don't have the real vision of where we are no? you are inside the node you really know need to know in advance uh, what you have around you in order to make some meaningful moves. But, okay, it's, uh, it's moving in a tree, a data structure, so... Uh, we will talk uh, later about all these on properties, which are all the possible events that we, we can work with, with these elements. Mm -hmm. And this, is, we, we, we played on the table, uh, element, we, every element we can uh, refer and expand as the same, more or less the same list of elements. Some of them are special because, for example, we have the tbody property or the thead property. So in this case, a table element, uh, we, ex we, we, we pointed to the first row by entering to the table body and then entering to the first row. And uh, there's a shortcut property. Instead of uh, what I wrote before was uh, uh, table dot children dot item uh, uh, zero uh, one. Sorry, the second element head and body. I could have just written uh, table dot t bodies of zero. 
in this case, the body is plural because there may be more than one body in a table, and so on. So there are a lot of uh, no, shortcuts that some 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 types of uh, types of nodes give me some additional properties. Uh, the last point about uh, uh, the, the structure of a node is are the attributes. So uh, we have an attribute property that contains the list of all attributes of a given node. So in this case, we have two attributes, a class and a style attribute. Class was already in the HTML file, and the style we just added it right now by uh, modifying the, the, the color property on the node. Okay, so uh, if we want to add a new attribute, we can just add a node here to this list, create a new uh, node of type attribute and append it to this list attributes. Or we can modify the existing attributes and so on. All the attributes that you have in the HTML element. Some of these already have shortcuts. We, we already saw that the, uh, the class uh, attributes has already a class name shortcut that this string table points exactly to the value of the class attributes, if it's defined, of course. So the basic level is uh, node children attributes. And all the rest are basically shortcuts to point to some child, the first one, the last one, or uh, shortcuts to point to, to some attributes, the style, the class, and so on. But of course, we will use more the shortcuts than, than the basic, uh, say, um, uh, data structures. Uh, so these are these slides try to summarize the uh, movement properties. So from a node moving to a parent, uh, to the children, to the siblings, all these properties point to a node or to null if there is no such node or such uh, yes, uh, other reference. And OK, this is the, what we already saw uh, before. If we want to modify the, some attributes, uh, we can use these methods so that let us manipulate easily the list of attributes. Okay. In some cases, like the style, we already have shortcut properties where you can set a string and you already create the attribute. Otherwise, uh, uh, it's a list. So for the list, we can get an element, you can remove, you can modify, and so on. Every, all the basic operations on this list uh, of attributes. Um, but uh, this is useful if, some, if you are using some attributes which are not just, basic, just the standard ones. But most of the attributes uh, are already uh, Duplicated as properties. For example, an image tag would have a source attribute, and you can access with the uh, uh, get attribute source or directly with image dot source because the same property is replicated the same no, is replicated directly as a shortcut property. Uh, the inspector will help us a lot uh, by seeing which are the properties that we want. Uh, we can try everything in the console and then. Uh, uh, write the, the JavaScript code. Inspect, inspecting elements is easy. Easy. Okay. You have to find your way around. Creating elements is more complex. Uh, well, not much more complex, but you need to create a new node and insert that node into the tree. These are two separate operations. You are creating an node object, and then you are saying where in the tree this node object should be put. Okay, parenting the node, giving a new parent to this node. Creating a node is done with the create methods, create elements, or create text node, depending on whether you are just creating some text to, to uh, put inside an element or a real HTML element with specific tag. So in this case, we are creating a div element, so create element with a div, and we we have this reference to this object that we can complete by setting other properties. Okay, I maybe I set the class name, maybe I set the inner text of all the properties of this, this of this div that will match this HTML fragment. 
right now this element is just a, a, an object created somewhere is not yet part of the page i just created a node for putting this content inside the page i must add it as a child of some other existing node with a method that typically is called a pen child so i create an element i set this, its properties and then i append it as a child of some other container element and at that point it will be part of the dom of the page and will behave exactly as uh, all the rest of the html in the page Uh, okay, a pen child is uh, one of the methods. There are all other methods uh, that are used to add uh, one new node uh, before, after, outside, uh, inside uh, of other nodes. Depends on when, where we want to insert this information. Okay, so this picture is very hard to exp explain with words, but <laughs> the arrows are very clear where you are putting the new, no, the new element uh, starting from an existing one. Um, again, these are the old methods, and these are the say, newer, newer methods that are more complete and also have, have a more consistent naming, hmm? in a way. So insert before is also uh, before, and append child is also after. Hmm? The same. Or we use the shortcut of setting the inner HTML and we let with the inner HTML we are providing a string and we let the browser parse that string, understand which elements are there, creating all the nodes for us. So we are asking the, the parsing engine of the browser, please do a set of create elements uh, for me. That will create this this specific fragment of HTML. That then I can append in the as an inner HTML property of, a, of another element. Hmm? Uh, and the same can be done uh, by inserting not just inside an element by but around the element. So before, after, around it. Uh, there's this insert adjacent HTML where the first parameter is uh, the position where you want to insert that. So there are a lot of housekeeping methods for managing this, uh, this, this tree of nodes. Let's forget about cloning. Uh, we saw that for applying styles, uh, we can work with classes. So we have a class list. And the class list being a list has some methods for working at a high level, remove a class, Add a class, very interesting toggle class. So whether it's present, delete it, and if it's, if it's uh, missing, add it. Huh? We can maybe toggle between visible and not visible. And query the list of classes. So we don't, need, we don't even have to parse a string of space separated class names, but we work directly with a class or with a style, as we saw before. It takes a while no, to get used to all of these you know, abundant uh, uh, set of elements, uh, but uh, we can get around that. Let's try to do something practical just to fix the ideas. Hmm? So right now we just played uh, in the console with a static page. Um, what we could do here now is to try to convert this page into a dynamic page where the uh, list of uh, exams is not just not written to the page but is generated dynamically so we assume that we have uh, somewhere uh, an array hmm, of uh, with the, all these scores and we want to create a table that represents the content of that array we, that will be the normal case. Normally, the content of the array will be loaded from a database that will be on the server, but this will be for later. For now, we just create a static array inside the code, and we try to 
create the table content corresponding to that array. And uh, so let's try to transform our previous HTML page. Let's make it a bit larger. OK. So this was the code for last week, more or less. I just polished a bit the CSS, but nothing more okay, that we had last week. What we want to do now is to add some code okay, for dyna dynamically creating the content of the, the, t the table body. Uh, we already have some this call uh, main.js uh, that we can uncomment right now. And uh, possibly we can defer its execution so that it will be actually executed after the page is being logged. And so we can open a main.js and start writing some code. So we can new file main.js use strict maybe we zoom it a little bit more and we can start this code that I'm writing here will be executed right after the browsers finish logging the page Okay, so for example, I can uh, find the table, the table like I did before, document dot query selector table, and just to be sure, I can maybe try to console dot log table dot children. Child not the length. Just to print something and see that it's working. I expect uh, to have uh, uh, a result of five printed in the console. That's not very useful, but just to check whether it's working. So remember to save the HTML because we added the script and save in the JavaScript. And if we just go and reload the page, we are, of course, missing the red color because it was just a local modification inside the DOM. When we are re reloading the page, everything will be reloaded from scratch, so it doesn't remember anything. And I see that the console contains the number five, our magic word. So this tells us Two things. One is the code has actually been executed. And second, it has been executed after the loading of the page. Not right in the header. Because in the header, the, the code would have no way of knowing the table had five children. You know, five are the ta table body, table uh, heading, and the three spaces. Mm -hmm. and three, three text fragments uh, that just contain white space. But it was just a check to be sure that we had the, the right elements. OK, so we, we know we can execute some code. We already have some code from uh, that helps us manage the list of exams. That was in last week's uh, work. Well, basically two weeks ago, because last week we were working with the uh, with database, and we don't have the database here on the, in the browser. And so I pulled from two weeks ago the file exam.js when we had a simple constructor function exam and a simple constructor function exam list. I just copied there into this folder. So if I need to use these functions, I can load also these functions in the browser. It's called exams.js. So let's go and modify the index.html by loading defer source uh, exams.js. 
defer, not defer. Instead of copy and paste in the text inside the JavaScript file, I load one file that contains some function definitions, and then I load another file that may use those functions. So in our code, well, let's go and see. Let's reload it. In uh, this is Firefox, we have a debugger tab here in the inspector that will tell us which JavaScript files have been loaded. In, in this case, we see here in this file, there are two sources, exam and main. Okay, so we can see the source code and set breakpoints uh, in the JavaScript code. So Firefox put them, puts the information in the debugger tab. Uh, Chrome is a bit different, so let me reload this page. And it puts this information, I think, in the sources tab. Okay, but it's the same. Basically, they are a copy of each other and try to. Again, we can set breakpoints here in the code by clicking on the line in both browsers. And we stop execution. So we see that this page loads exams and main. And we'll actually run them because, yeah, I reloaded the page and we'll, it's still printing the five. Of course, I don't want to print five. I want to create a list of exams that will populate the table. So let's use those functions to create. Uh, so this is not useful. We can comment it out. We can create it um, for, for example, uh, exams, uh, like a new exam list. Uh, and uh, we can add some exams to it, exams uh, dot add uh, new exam. What are the parameters? Code. Oh, let me copy it from here. I don't have the code, so I make it up. Uh, and then the name. Then we have a score, which is 30. Then we have a date, which is this date. I don't remember whether we need to create a DJS object or it will be created internally. Let me just check here. Yeah, it will convert it in me internally. So we just I just need to pass a string. And they can add a second one, for example. Uh, so zero two x y z, and the name of the course will be this one. So engineering. Twenty eight. But whatever value you want. Yes. What is missing? Sorry. Ah, the, the credits. Yeah. Where is it supposed to be? Uh, name CFU. Okay. So six uh, and it's eight. Thank you. Yeah, the table doesn't show all the information that we have in our model. So does it work? I don't know. That log exams. Let's have a look. Let's try to run this. Right now, we are not interacting with the web page in any way. We are not using the document. It's just JavaScript code that runs and crashes, probably. Yeah. It crashes because it's telling me DJS is not defined. Of course. We need also to preload all the libraries that we need. Where? Inside the HTML page. So we go again to the HTML page, and before the exam, exams.js, we need to load the JS. Uh, where do we load it from? Uh, day.js.org. We 
can see that they are telling us to, to install it in the browser. You can just download it somewhere and uh, load it from your own files or use their uh, cloud service to download it from there. So we are lazy, so we download it from there. Can we add this deeper again? Back here. So we are loading the JS. If we need some plugins, we need to download them also. We need to keep track of the libraries that we are relying on. Then there is my library, and there's the main code. All of them will be downloaded and put together and executed together in a whole big context. So if I load this HTML now, okay, it will print, uh, no, no longer print an error because now the JS is found and it will tell me that the exam list is, is an exam list uh, that uh, contains two uh, exams uh, or with these codes uh, and uh, and um, and contents. Okay. We see that the console in the browser is normally much more powerful than the console in Node.js because but every time we print something on the console, we automatically are in the in an inspector that we, we can expand it, and we don't have the problem in the Node.js that will terminate the execution and not let us inspect the variables and also. With the console, we have the full uh, access to these variables. Uh, so uh, the the variable was called. Uh, how was it called? Uh, sorry, I don't remember. Exams. Uh, I can I can put it here and see the object and modify it here. Start in the console. Yeah. The other question? No, sorry. The the the. the Uh, it should work because the names of the function will be injected at the top level. So uh, it should find, be able to find them as long as... No, sorry. I can... So the question was uh, uh, whether the, I said, the order of the script loadings will be important or not. Of course, uh, in order to... These first two scripts uh, only define functions. They can be loaded in any order. They don't do anything, really. They are defined, the JS is defining its own objects, uh, and main JS is defining my two constructor functions. They don't depend on each other. Uh, the main, actually, is calling some function. So this function should be defined uh, uh, when, uh, when the code is executed. So these are really executed some instructions. So we cannot move, uh, we can sh no, shuffle the, the library loading or function definition, but they should be before the real execution of the, because otherwise I'm trying to execute a function, even here, new class list, sorry, a new exam list, the name will not be defined, because they are executed in order, okay, asynchronously, but in order. Uh, for now. Okay. Because this is not, it's not a normal way of executing the code. You're, right now we are executing the code synchronously at the end of the loading of the page. After a while, when we see some events, uh, we will try to attach this code execution to the event of uh, page loading so that it will run at the same at the, at the later time. And in that case, it uh, will not matter anymore <laughs> because the, everything will be loaded before executing the code. Uh, when we move next week uh, uh, to, to React, uh, we will use a new syntax called the import statement uh, that does all the work for us. Okay, So we don't need to do this explicitly. Right now we are still in a basic JavaScript mode. Um, OK, so we have this data. Can we create the HTML table starting from this data? It's boring, but probably we know how to do that. 
So we can find the table body and we need to replace the current table body with a new body that we are creating. So let's find, sorry, let's find the table body. Document dot query selector the body. We can we should wipe out the current content of the body. The body that in our HTML is empty. And then we must add one new row to our tbody for every element of this exam list. So we, we may have the exams dot exam list dot for each. For each exam, we process the exam content. Okay, it could be just a, new, a simple for statement. I use the for each that because we are we are in JavaScript. Nothing special, nothing asynchronous here. Okay, just looping over the list of exams. For each exam, we need to create a new row, populate the row with the right content, and add this row to the table body. So we need to create a row, so const t r equal to document new element, create element of type table row. Okay, then we create a first cell of the table that contains the name of the course. Const table data one, the first cell. We create a new element, document, create element, table data. And we set the content of this table data. TD1 dot uh, will be a text content. The TD will only contain some raw text, not some HTML, not some other elements. Letter B will be the, the name of the course, so it's exam dot name and this is the first cell the second cell the same const table data two doc create another document dot create element another table data and we fill the text content of this table data number two with the, the score so exam dot score And the third cell, so no, sorry, TD2 dot text content. And we have a third cell with the date, if I remember well. So we need to create a, a third const table data tree document dot create element or document here. It's a typo. Create element, another table data, and we set the content of this table data three dot co uh, text content with uh, uh, exam dot date political date, and these are DJS objects, so we need to format with uh, your month and day because we need a string so right now what do we have we have four different html elements sitting in the void disconnected from everything we must assemble the row td dot append not a t row append child td td1 we append the first cell as a child of the row, the second append child 
the second DD2, second cell, and we append the third cell, append the child, table data three. So right now, we assemble the three data cell to the row element container. It's still in the void, it's still disconnected from the page. We need to add it to the page by appending to the reality body. The body, but append child row. It's boring, it's error prone, but it's not complicated. Does it, does it work? I don't know. Let's try it. Did I say? Okay. So I didn't say, sorry. Reload. Oh, okay. There are no errors in the console and actually this data is probably, let me check. Yeah, it's really taken from my array. So the previous content has been wiped out, and now it's coming from my data structure. This is one way of, of building a part of the page. You, you build it with a lot of patience, element by element. Or you use the inner HTML property to build a string. An alternative way of doing that would have been to uh, use a, a string and assign it to the inner HTML of the, of the table body. Okay, so I just could say, um, okay, I need a table row still. I could write, sorry, what's here? What I could write here, it would be simply table row dot inner HTML equal, and we use a string interpolation, for example, and we write some code, td slash td, first cell, td slash td, second cell, td slash td, third, third cell, and in the middle, we interpolate, uh, for example, exam dot name, And in the second cell, we interpolate exam dot uh, score. In the third cell, we interpolate uh, exam dot date. And uh, sorry, before, and we of, of course need to append this to the table body. So instead of this bunch of codes, Instead, we could create the nodes, or we could create the HTML string corresponding to the nodes. And it should work in the same way. Oh. Yeah. OK, the date is different because I, didn't, I forgot to format it. So it's up to us. We can work in both ways. In both cases, we are recreating the same structure, the same tree of nodes. Three of note that uh, is now part of the page. So you see, the, if you are inspecting the page, you no longer see the, the initial content. We are, it's, it's all happening in live, in real time. When we delete some notes, and the, the, the initial HTML of the page has been forgotten. Once the browser loads the HTML, it, it creates a DOM, and then the DOM is the source of truth. 
is the only information that we have for the page and that we need for the page. If we modify the DOM, the page is modified immediately. And we see all, so everything we see on the left, everything we see on the inspector, on the console, in our JavaScript code, you know, it's all synchronized. Okay. So this is the low level manipulation of the DOM. I think we already had enough. And imagine doing something more complex in this way. And but right now we just executed a one fragment of code at one point in time. So at the initial paid loading. What happens when we want to execute different parts of code at different points in time? When user clicks on something or and this is what we are going to see after the break. So how, how this combines with the handling of asynchronous events. Right now, there's nothing asynchronous yet. Okay? So we can have a 15 minutes or so of a break, and then we move on to the, to the, to se the second point of today's job. Like, uh, we learned how to load dynamically the exam list, uh, and let's try to add one functionality, deleting one item from this list. We add a delete button. And when we click on this button, that row should disappear. Okay? So see you after the wait, after the break. <laughs>